food impaction what is food impaction let's see certain def uh, let's see the definition of food impaction and the other certain terminologies now food impaction is defined as a forceful wedging of food into the periodontium by occlusal forces now what are these cusps that tend to wedge the food into or forcefully wedge the food into the interdental areas of the periodontium now these cusps that tend to forcefully wedge the food interproximally are termed as plunger cusps now I'll define again. Now food impaction is defined as forceful wedging of food into the periodontal tissues by occlusal forces. And the cusps that tend to wedge this food forcefully into the interproximal areas are defined as pl plunger cusps. What are the factors leading to food impaction? Hirschfeld has given four factors which are responsible for causing this food impaction. They include your uneven occlusal wear, your loss of proximal contact, the congenital morphological abnormalities of the teeth, and then improperly constructed restorations. What are the types of food impaction? You have two types. You have a vertical food impaction and you have a lateral food impaction. The vertical food impaction is mainly caused by the four factors that Hirschfeld has mentioned. That is your loss of proximal contact, your uneven occlusal wear, overhanging restorations or any other prosthetic or restorative uh, uh, corrections or uh, prosthetic or restorative problems and then your uh, other factor that is your congenital morphologic abnormalities. Now the cusp which causes it are the plunger cusp. If you see the lateral food impaction, the lateral food impaction is mainly caused by the surrounding tissues, either from the forces from the tongue or forces from the cheeks or forces from the lips. Now that will be what is called as lateral food impaction. What are the signs and symptoms of food impaction? The food impaction has certain typical signs and symptoms. The patient feels a kind of an eat. Uh, he feels like using a toothpick and constantly digging the area in order to remove the uh, food that is lodged because it creates a constant kind of a pressure in that interproximal areas. And then he might also complain of a vague, dull, kind of a gnawing type of a pain deep in the jaws. And then it is associated with gingival inflammation, that is bleeding on probing, a foul smell and then foul taste which is involved in the, the area. There can be gingival recession, periodontal abscess formation because of the lodgement of a lot of food in the area in the periodontium which is blocking the periodontal pocket uh, area and then varying degrees of inflammatory responses involvement of the periodontal ligament. Apart from that, the patient can also complain of sensitivity to percussion with, if you take a radiograph and see, there will be a typical alveolar bone loss and most of the times it is a vertical pattern of bone loss and food impaction that you see. And then you also, the patient might also have root caries in the area that is lodged with food, or impacted with food. Now, what is the importance of uh, the seek, uh, of the food impaction? Why do we need to know? So, what happens when the food gets impacted interproximally? What is the sequelae behind food impaction? Now, immediately the food over a period of time, it keeps getting impacted in the interproximal areas. Over a period of time, it causes gingival inflammation. Now, this gingival inflammation further progresses to involve your uh, pocket or there is a deepening of the gingival sulcus leading to the periodontal pocket formation. Once the pocket formation is resulted and then slowly, gradually, there would be more and more amount of food that is getting impacted and over a period of time it can lead to alveolar bone loss. And then further, once the alveolar bone starts wearing off or once the alveolar bone starts getting resolved, what you have is the tooth mobility. And then on fine day, you would have tooth loss. So that would be the sequelae of food impaction. That would end. How do you treat, before we would end the session, how would you treat food impaction? The first thing is if you have to correct correct if any of the restorative procedures are the reason for the food impaction. For example, a sub overhanging subgingival restorations, if that is the reason, you need to correct the uh, subgingival uh, restorations and you have to bring it to the proper contour. You should make sure that the lost uh, the proximal contact is remade between the teeth so in order to prevent. Suppose you have an uneven occlusal wear or you have a typical plunger cast, what you have to do, you have to do something called as a selective grinding and probably if it is too, if the occlusal wear is too, uh, it's too much, it's almost approximating the pulp, then probably you have to do a root canal therapy for that particular tooth and give a crown so that you can maintain the interproximal height. 
that would be and apart from that you have to eliminate the now this is the elimination of the cause of food impaction then how do you treat the periodontal sequelae after food impaction you have to do a proper scaling and root planing control the gingival inflammation and then probably open the flap or do a flap surgery if regenerative procedure is needed probably you have to go ahead with the regenerative procedure and then follow up the patient and then put him on if needed put him on some antimicrobial mouth rinses for a period of time and then follow up the patient and evaluate the status so that would conclude food impaction thank you let's take up the topic tooth mobility and splinting now what is tooth mobility the tooth that moves from one place to another in any kind of a direction whether vertical direction or the facial lingual direction would be called or in a horizontal I, that's what i meant horizontal direction or a vertical direction would be called as a tooth mobility now this tooth mobility can occur under physiological conditions or even under some pathology the all teeth have some slight degree of physiological mobility it varies for different teeth at different periods of time of the day it is greatest on arising in the morning and progressively decreases over the time now why is it that the minute you get up you might feel some kind of a mobility in the tooth now that is natural for anyone that is because the overnight your tissues are in a relaxed condition and the minute you uh, wake up in the morning you tend to bite so that gives a kind of a uh, force onto your periodontal ligament to the rest to the rested periodontal ligament therefore you feel some kind of a mobility there and the mobility increases for a single rooted tooth than that of a multi rooted tooth mobility beyond the physiological range would be termed as your pathologic mobility what are the causes of increased mobility you have the, the, the causes have been listed out when you have a loss of alveolar bone because of a periodontal disease then the first important would be the periodontal disease being one of the important causes of increased tooth mobility followed by to trauma from occlusion your periapical pathologies the post periodontal surgeries which is limited only for a short period of time pregnancy menstrual cycle associated or even use of hormonal contraceptives can cause or increase the tooth mobility or any certain pathological processes in the jaws or also can cause like cysts and tumors can cause uh, mobility of the jaws coming to the mobility now the mobility can occur in two stages you have an intra socket stage and you have a secondary stage the initial or the intra socket stage meaning to say the tooth moves within the socket within the confinement of your periodontal ligament and it is associated with the viscoelastic distortion of your pdl and this uh, amount would range from 0.05 mm to about 1 0.10 mm in the secondary stage it usually occurs as a gradual process and it entails elastic deformation of the alveolar bone in response to an increased horizontal forces how do you diagnose tooth mobility if you can see the picture you can diagnose by two methods clinically the first method is you can use two blunt ends of the instrument and then place both the ends of the instrument on one on the palatal surface of the tooth and one on the buccal surface of the tooth and then keep one blunt end of the instrument stabilized whereas the other one is used to detect the movement of mobility and then you can also do instead of two ends of a metallic instrument you can always use one finger and the other one of a blunt end of an instrument what that is way you detect it clinically other methods of detecting mobility would be use of a periodontal that's an advanced diagnostic aid wherein you can use a periodontometer also called as a mobilometer now the grades of mobility can be given by grade 1 grade 2 grade 3 the grade 1 meaning slightly more than normal grade 2 is moderately more than normal grade 3 is severe mobility wherein you can see appreciate mobility in a horizontal that is a facial lingual direction and even in a vertical direction most of the times what they have noticed is that the uh, teeth where the mobility is seen now these teeth are importantly or uh, most of the time they are harbored with certain group of microorganisms which include your campylobacter rectus and your peptostreptococcus micros how do you treat mobility the grade 1 mobility definitely probably it would resolve with just a scaling and root planing procedure if your periodontal uh, periodontitis is the sole reason now how do you treat grade 2 mobility you have certain splints in which are used in periodontal therapy to treat your mobility apart from that your grade 3 mobility obviously you might have to go for an extraction it would have if it has a hopeless prognosis if you def to define a splint a splint is defined as an appliance which is used for 
immobilization of an injured or a deceased part. So basically trying to immobilize a deceased part and this would be called as a splint. Now what is a dental splint? A dental splint is basically defined as joining two or more teeth with some rigid material by means of either a fixed or a removable restorations or devices. What is a periodontal splint? A periodontal splint, it is an appliance that is used for maintaining or stabilizing mobile teeth in their functional position. There are two schools of thought according uh, based uh, regarding your splints that are used in periodontal therapy. The one school of thought is that the splints have a harmful effects and the other school having that they have a beneficial effects. Let's see what are the harmful effects that splints can have. The splints have or they accumulate a lot of plaque. They provide an environment for plaque accumulation. Apart from that, they can limit the functional movement of the teeth and therefore at times can lead to ankylosis. What are the beneficial aspects? Now, it can provide the mobile teeth which are uh, present can, if you can, if you're able to splint the teeth, it can provide functioning, refunctioning of the teeth, okay? Apart from that, non-mobile teeth will heal faster when compared to your mobile teeth. What are the objectives of splinting? It provides an adequate rest to the teeth and then it provides redirecting the forces. Also, it helps in redistribution of the forces and it preserves the arch integrity. It restores the functional stability and a psychological well-being and to stabilize mobile teeth during surgical procedures. Now, you know you have a tooth that is mobile, but still you want to go ahead with the surgery, then probably you can splint the teeth and then go ahead with the surgery to prevent the eruption of the teeth without an antagonist. Now, these are the objectives of splinting. What are the classification of splints? Now, based on the time period that you can keep the splints, you have temporary splints, you have provisional splints, and you have permanent splints. Now, the splints that are used for less than six months would be your temporary, which are used for at least a period of six months, would be your provisional, and the permanent, which are used for greater than six months. Whether the uh, depending on the type of material, you also have bonded splints, and you have the braided splints. The bonded splints include your composite resins. The braided ones include use of a stainless steel wire. To, uh, depending on the location of the tooth, you have intracoronal splints and you have your extracoronal splints. Your FPDs, that is your fixed partial dentures, do act as splints. Indications of splinting. When do you have to do splinting? The first indication would be when you have a moderate kind of an moderate to an advanced kind of a tooth mobility, especially your grade 2 mobile mobilities. If it interferes with normal masticatory function, then you can go about splinting the mobile teeth. It facilitates scaling to facilitate scaling and root planing procedures and even surgical procedures to stabilize teeth after an orthodontic movement and then to stabilize teeth after an acute dental trauma. Suppose you had the patient has had a fall and the tooth is avulsed so you immediately place it back into the socket and then you can splint it and wait for a healing period now, apart from that the other indications include to prevent tipping and drifting of teeth and to prevent extrusion of the unopposed tooth what are the characteristics of an ideal splint an ideal splint should have certain characteristics what are they they should be easily available they should be economical and they should be stable and they should be easily maintainable and then they should be rigid and they should be durable they should be compatible with your adjacent tissues what are the principles of uh, splinting it includes inclusion of sufficient number of teeth of healthy teeth now you have your 1 1 and 3 1 uh, sorry your your 3 1 and 4 1 are mobile so you bet and your uh, 4 2 and 3 2 are absolutely in healthy condition so what you can do you involve your healthy teeth and you can splint from 4 2 to 3 2 and then you need to splint around the arch and then the coronoplasty should be performed in cases where there is a occlusal a traumatic occlusion so first relieve the traumatic occlusion and then only splint the teeth you can fabricate the splint as an indirect way or a direct splinting can also be done indirect meaning in the laboratory and then you can take the splint and bond it um, in the clinic apart from that even the principle it should be aesthetically pleasing and then it should not interfere with occlusion and that would come to a uh, conclusion of uh, or that could conclude the entire topic on tooth mobility and splinting. Thank you.